Namaste and good evening. This time I thought I would give a little talk about how can we see God. Has anybody ever asked you that? Oh, how can we see God or how can I see God or how can we ever expect to know whether there's a God or not? Well, first of all, when it comes to trying to see God, if we expect to see God with our material senses, we need to first understand the limitations of the senses that we have. We often need glasses, like I certainly do, merely to see clearly, or we also need enough light to do so. If it is too dark, or if there is no light with which to see, we can hardly make out what is right in front of us. So it is fair enough to say that we will have, well, we'll never see that which is spiritual with these dull material senses. However, even when it comes to researching the smallest elements like the atoms and then defining parts of them like neutrons, protons, etc., do the scientists actually see every molecule that they discuss, even with super powerful microscopes? Sometimes not. In some cases, they can only see the evidence that such particles exist, but do not directly see the particle itself. Similarly, even if we cannot see God directly with our material senses, we can still look around and see the evidence for God's existence. But to, know, but to do that, we also need to have the right knowledge. For example, even a person with common sense, just a little common sense even, can understand that there must be a source of everything, a point of origin, or what some call an absolute truth, or the underlying basis or foundation for everything. And that something can be called God, or the Supreme. That is why, in some circles, people ask, what is not God? And in that respect, we can perceive that everything is a part of God, or everything is but a display of God's energy, including ourselves. Then we can begin to see or feel the presence of God all around us. However, in the Vedic sources of knowledge, such as the Bhagavad Gita, we find wherein Lord Krishna himself begins to instruct Arjuna how to recognize him in so many things. By meditating on and understanding this knowledge, we can begin to more closely recognize the evidence for God all around us, especially in great or powerful things. So in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verses 4 through 11, Lord Krishna explains, and I quote, Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Altogether, these eight comprise my separated material energies. Besides this inferior energy, O mighty armed Arjuna, there is a superior energy of mine, which are all living entities, namely us, who are struggling with material nature and are sustaining the universe. All of that is material, and all that is spiritual in this world. Know for certain that I am both its origin and dissolution. O conqueror of wealth, Arjuna, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. O son of Kunti, Arjuna, I am the taste of fresh water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the sound in ether and ability in man. I am the original fragrance of the earth, and I am the heat in fire. I am the life of all that lives, and I am the penances, which brings one closer to God, of all the ascetics. O son of Prita, know that I am the original seed of all existences, the intelligence of the intelligent, and the prowess of all powerful men. I am the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire." End quote. So recognizing God in nature is also outlined in such Vedic texts as the Atharva Veda. Therein it is explained, and I quote, God is present in all the forces of nature. He identifies himself with these faultless and blameless forces, and their home is in God, vast like the ocean. So do the Vedic scholars say unto us. They, the forces of nature, come quickly at the time of creation and vanish at the time of dissolution of the universe. That's the Atharva Veda, book 2, chapter 3, verse 3. And it goes on and explains, God is the Lord of all the worlds. God gave the sun its intense heat. God, through his manifold forces, has set in motion the earth, moon, and the planets in space. End quote. That's from 8 to 40. The existence of God is also perceived by beholding all that God created. Herein it is described in the Atharva Veda, 8, 7, verses 29 through 39, it says, just as the sun has brought forth the day, the day derives its origin from him, meaning the sun. So the existence of God is perceived by beholding the universe. 
which in reality is created by him, meaning the Supreme Lord. Just as the sun appears to be born from the night, as it appears after its expiry, and night is born of the sun as it sets in the evening, so the existence of God is perceived by beholding the great night of dissolution, or the end of the universe as well, which in reality is also created by him, meaning the Supreme. The sun comes into existence after the atmosphere, or the elements, as if he has produced it, and the existence of atmosphere is realized by beholding the sun. In other words, they both take each other to exist. So the existence of God is also perceived by beholding the atmosphere, which in reality is created by Him, the Supreme Himself. In the same way, the existence of God is perceived by beholding and viewing air, the heaven, the regions, the earth, the fire, the waters, all of which in reality are created by Him. The existence of God is perceived by studying the holy Vedic verses as well, which in reality are also revealed by Him. That's end, the end of the quote from the Atharva Veda. So another aspect of this is that by understanding the forces of nature, the powerful in men, the different aspects that we can see that are glorious, that all reflect the existence of the Supreme Creator. Another aspect of the description of Bhagavad Gita is to recognize how God himself descends into this material realm to reveal himself through his divine instructions, pastimes, personality, and to show us his form. And even if he is not in front of us personally, we can learn about him and see him through the descriptions of the Vedic Shastra. Thus, even though we may not be able to see him with our material senses, we can indeed he can, he can re, indeed reveal himself and make himself visible to us through such instruction. So, however, we also need to become qualified to do that, which we will discuss shortly. But the point of it is, and another aspect of seeing God, is that found in the descriptions that many of you have no doubt heard about in near-death experiences. Often it is described that in such an experience someone may be going down a tunnel, sometimes greeted by past relatives, deceased relatives, I mean, or until they finally approach a fantastic light, uh, a being of unconditional love and acceptance. They often do not exactly see the form of this being, since it is engulfed in light, but they accept the being to be the object of their faith or religion, such as Jesus or Buddha or Krishna or someone similar. When our own level of consciousness is lower than the higher beings that we may encounter, as in a near-death experience, we may often see them and the frequency in which they exist as merely white light. In other words, we have not elevated our own consciousness to the frequency of that level of, of existence to be able to perceive and discern all the details therein. Thus, we perceive such entities as either beings of light or engulfed in effulgence. A similar experience is described in the Shriya Shapanishad in mantras 15 and 16, where it says, and I quote, O oh my Lord, sustainer of all that lives, your real face is covered by your dazzling effulgence. Please remove that covering and exhibit yourself to your pure devotees. O oh my Lord, O oh primeval philosopher, maintainer of the universe, O oh regulating principle, destination of the pure devotees, well-wisher of the progenitors of mankind, please remove that effulgence of your transcendental rays so that I can see your form of bliss. You are the eternal supreme personality of Godhead, like unto the sun, as am I. End quote. So in this way, we have to raise ourselves to the same refined frequency or energy level as God in our endeavor to perceive him directly, beyond the dazzling effulgence in this case. Also, the last statement in the above paragraph means that as the sunshine is basically of the same quality and essence as the sun itself, and in an expansion of it, so we are also the same spiritual quality as God. We are not as powerful as God, but we are of the same essential quality. Thus, seeing God is not unexpected, but we simply have to regain that uh, spiritual quality in our consciousness to acquire the ability to perceive God directly. And all that really means is to reduce the power of the material energy's influence on ourselves through our spiritual practice. 
One more example I would like to use is the radio and television waves that carry the signals of so many stations, whether it be news, music, entertainment, or other forms of communication that are all around us all the time. However, if I do not know about them, or do not think they exist, then how can you convince me that they are real? After all, you cannot see them, taste them, smell them, or feel them. So how can you convince someone that they are real? The answer is that you have to have a good receiver, a good radio, or something like that. Then anyone will see that such waves are all around us, but they mean nothing unless you have a good receiver. Then you realize that throughout the frequency range in which these waves travel, there are so many such waves, and that they are extremely useful with numerous things that can be done with them. You can even broadcast your own radio waves simply by your cell phone, or use your GPS system, etc. Then they become such a common part of our everyday lives that we no longer even think about them. So if someone says that radio and television waves are not real, or that he does not believe in them, what would you think of the guy? Obviously, this guy has no knowledge, has no experience, he is not in touch with reality, which means he must have been living in, under a rock or in a closet or way out in the wilderness all of his life. You would think that he is just too weird. Similarly, if someone has no knowledge of God and says he does not believe in God, what would you think? Pretty much the same thing, that he is merely out of touch with the proper knowledge that would help make someone understand how to recognize God. Therefore, another way to perceive God is through the instructions and knowledge as given by a spiritual master or a person who is a good receiver of the transcendental vibration that exists all around us. Thus, he can receive or perceive it and then also broadcast the spiritual knowledge through his instructions that will allow us to understand it, or at least to those who will listen. This is how we learn through such personal instructions or through books that are written by such pure receptors of the spiritual vibrations. It is also through this means that we can train ourselves to, such, to be such receivers of spiritual vibrations or frequencies if we want to. We have to learn it from others to be able to do it ourselves. It is through the spiritual practices as provided by those spiritual teachers who are already successful and through the information and instructions given in the Vedic text that will also enable us to elevate our consciousness and the vibrational frequency in which we operate. Then we can also see that which exists in those higher dimensions or spiritual realms. Therefore, unlike those religions that depend mostly on faith, the Vedic or Dharmic system is that a person follows the path to spiritualize their consciousness to the point where the spiritual dimension becomes perceptible and then one can begin to enter into that dimension and function on that level. The point is that our consciousness is where we live. We may keep our body in a house or in a particular set of clothes and so on, but it is our consciousness that is the vibrational frequency in which we live and send out to others. And as we raise that frequency, we will be able to see that which exists on those higher frequencies as well. In other words, the more spiritual you become, the more you can perceive that which is spiritual. That's a common saying of mine. But anyway, as you become more spiritual, meaning the more you spiritualize your consciousness, then the more qualified you become to recognize, approach, and even see God in so many ways. And once you begin to have that experience, then there is no further argument about what is or what is not God. So would you like to become such a perceiver of the spiritual realm? If you do, then the way we work to uplift and spiritualize our consciousness includes the following, such as chanting or singing devotional songs, or the names of God, using mantras for japa, meditation, associating with like-minded people, discussing this knowledge and information with others, like we're doing now, especially by going to the temple, for example, or with groups uh, that form specifically for that purpose, and even eating blessed uh, vegetarian food and Krishna Prasad, food that's been offered in such a way. These are some of the methods what, that will help spiritualize your consciousness. And we've already explained many of these processes in greater detail as related in my other articles or free ebooks and paperback books, all of which are described on my website, which you can uh, see at uh, www.stephen-knapp.com 
or my blog at stephennapp.wordpress.com. So good luck. These are all different ways that we can perceive the existence of God and uh, how we can enter into the spiritual dimension. Namaste and Jai Shri Krishna.